I've played many games in my time, but I've never played a series as riveting and atmospheric as the Metro series from 4A Games. A small development team based out of Ukraine managed to create a cult classic with the original game, Metro 2033 released back in 2010. Three years later, they went on to create a bigger and better sequel in every way with Metro Last Light. Now, the third game in the franchise, Metro Exodus, has been released into the wild and it has received glowing praise from both diehard fans and newcomers alike. What better time to revisit the first two games in the series than now? This video will explore the various components of both Metro Metro 2033 and Metro Last Light that have made them so endearing to gamers across the world years after their release. Metro 2033 and Metro Last Light are two of my favorite games of all time, and this is why. Now, this video will be very different from the previous ones in this series, uh, as I will be covering not just one, but two games, and as such, I will be splitting them into two separate sections. I'll still be following the same guidelines I established in previous videos, however, so without further introductions, let's start with the beginning chapter, Metro 2033. In the year 2013, nuclear war devastated the Earth, and no one was left unscathed. The world was engulfed in fire, but several thousand survivors fled into the relative safety of the underground metro tunnels in Moscow, Russia. Twenty years pass, and those same survivors have created a new civilization underneath the scarred surface. New cities and towns are built, new factions rise to power, and new creatures roam the earth, eventually finding their way into the metro system below. <laughs> Humanity lives a harrowing existence, as each breath taken could be your last, and every minute is a fight for survival against the nightmarish mutants and the darker shades of human nature. You play as a young man named Artyom, a simple citizen of an outlying station carrying out a seemingly normal existence underground. However, that existence is upended when a terrifying new threat from the surface emerges that seeks to wipe out the remnants of humanity still living inside the tunnels. These creatures are called the Dark Ones, and they are the greatest threat that the tunnel dwellers have ever faced. They hold considerable power and psychic abilities which render their victims inert in the worst ways imaginable. They are neither human nor mutant in nature, but something far more mysterious and alien. Artyom must venture out into the deepest recesses of the metro tunnels, and also onto the shattered ruins of Moscow's surface, in order to find a way to halt the Dark One's advance, and ultimately save the human race itself. The story of Metro 2033 is fantastic, and there's so much world building contained within that I find it hard to summarize the events of the game in a truly effective way, but I will try my best regardless. Artyom must venture to Polis, the heart and cultural capital of the Metro at the behest of Hunter, a member of the infamous Spartan Rangers, an order that carries on the tradition of those ancient warriors who fought so long ago. They are the protectors of the Metro, and they fight against all forms of evil, whether they be human or mutant in nature. Artyom mission is to convince the leadership of Polis to devise a plan to combat the Dark Ones and wipe them from the face of the Earth. As Artyom's journey progresses, he encounters many mutated creatures and also the various factions of the Metro, including but not limited to Hansa, an almost mafia-like organization that controls the ring line circling the Metro. They are the primary benefactors behind all trade and commerce within the Metro, and they hold a significant amount of power and influence as a result. The Red Line, the remnants of the communist ideology popularized by Karl Marx. They carry on that governmental rule to great effect as they hold an iron grip over the many stations they call home 
and their respective inhabitants, the Fourth Reich. Second only to the Red Line in terms of sheer authority and military might, not even nuclear warheads could kill the ideas and philosophy of a madman like Adolf Hitler, whose hatred for all those deemed unpure lives on in the irradiated world of the Metro. Alongside these major factions, Artyom also encounters a colorful cast of side characters, with Bourbon, Khan, Ullmann, and the leader of the Spartan Order, Colonel Miller, being the standouts, both in terms of their personalities and their importance in the story. The Dark Ones are also seen throughout the many chapters of the story, and while they are very threatening in both appearance and stature, not all is as it seems. Without getting too specific, Metro 2033 also delves deep into the supernatural, and Artyom sees and hears glimpses of spirits long dead that are doomed to walk the earth for eternity. Part of the reason Metro 2033's story is so effective is because it is based largely on the novel of the same name, written by Russian author Dmitry Glukovsky, who also closely collaborated with 4A Games on the development of the game to ensure it properly captured the essence of the Metro universe, and make sure that the feeling of dread present in the book was felt throughout the gameplay experience, and to say they succeeded would be a huge understatement. Metro 2033, as a first-person shooter, naturally involves shooting things, and firing a gun is snappy and responsive, and it feels exactly the way it should. General gunplay is smooth as butter, and the weapon variety is certainly not lacking in terms of both style and options. There's the classic assault rifles, submachine guns, and shotguns, in addition to more cobbled-together weaponry, such as the pneumatic Tikhar, a long-range rifle that fires high-velocity ball bearings as ammunition. It requires the user to hand crank the pump on the front end to increase the air pressure required to shoot. Metro has an immense variety of weapons, but it is these handmade firearms that truly stand out, and it helps to differentiate Metro's gunplay, as manual action such as using a hand crank is something we never see in other more contemporary shooters. This also feeds into the survival mechanics of the game, of which there are many. You are given a flashlight early on, but when the light dims, you must hand crank a battery charger that leaves you vulnerable to attack. You are also given a bullet lighter as an additional light source, and the wind always carries the flame in the direction you need to go, which is a really cool and subtle navigation mechanic. Your journal and map are also an in-game item that you have to manually pull out, and all of these things combine to show just how committed 4A is to grounding the player in this universe. Feeding back into the weapons, there are two grades of ammunition found in the world of Metro. Dirty ammo, which is fairly cheap to forge and purchase in shops and armories throughout the tunnels, and military grade ammo, which is exceptionally rare, as there are no longer any efficient means of creating these rounds after the bombs fell. As a result of their rarity and value, they have become the only form of currency found within the Metro, and they can be used to purchase weapons and gear, but if you find yourself in a pinch, you can load these into your current weapon to add some extra bite to your bullets, although you are then firing away your only means of upgrading or buying new weapons and gear. It's a really cool mechanic that adds an extra level of strategy and tension on top of an already stress-filled experience. Now, one of the most fascinating and realistic gameplay mechanics is that when you eventually venture out onto the surface, the radiation level are so high that a gas mask is required to breathe. Gas masks, however, chew through their filters quite quickly, and you must scavenge for any available filters you can find. And if you run out in a heavily irradiated zone, well, you can imagine what comes next. <gasps> <coughs> <coughs>
just another gameplay device that adds to the overall immersion, and it helps to suck the player into this believable world. The best part? None of these mechanics I've listed feel intrusive in any way. In fact, they are integral to the overall experience, and they help to elevate Metro 2033's gameplay above other post-apocalyptic games. I know this tunnel, and it knows me. Let's move. Another area where Metro 2033 excels in is its level design. Metro is a very guided and linear experience, but it isn't a detriment, far from it in fact. Metro's linearity allows the game to be more focused in its overall design and its narrative flow. The tunnels are appropriately claustrophobic and really feel like they're squeezing the life out of you with their constrained aesthetic. The surface is also well laid out, and it feels just open enough that you can find side paths and loot caches, but not feel lost in the maze of burnt out buildings and dilapidated structures. 4A definitely made the right call, making this game more strict in its design, because it ultimately uplifts the other aspects of the game, and helps Metro 2033 find a unique identity among other shooters of today and yesteryear. The version of Metro 2033 you're currently seeing is actually the Redux version released in 2014, which is a complete remaster and overhaul of Metro 2033 to bring it up to today's graphical standards. And good god does this game impress with its visuals. Seriously, Metro 2033 can compete with some of the heavy hitters of today, such as DICE's Frostbite engine, in my opinion. The 4A engine is a remarkable achievement by the developers, and the lighting is the best in the FPS genre, hands down. They've only improved on the engine since 2033, but we'll get to that later. Suffice it to say, Metro 2033 is a showstopper graphically, and it holds up five years after the Redux version release. Hell, even the original Metro 2033 from 2010 holds up graphically, and it is still a graphics hog, even on my PC. If ever there was going to be a video game series based on the Metro novels, this is what it would look like, down to the smallest details. The mutants are grotesque and frightening. The dirt and grime of the tunnels reinforce the idea that humanity is on its last legs, and the surface is blanketed in thick snow and ice due to nuclear winter. It is quite literally hell frozen over. The weapons and character models are also intricately crafted, with individual screws and bolts visible on firearms, and makeshift body armor used by the tunnel dwellers looking rugged and filthy. Plus, I mean, come on, the Spartans just look totally badass. Metro 2033 has an appropriately solemn soundtrack, primarily featuring guitar strings to emphasize the loneliness and desperation of humanity living in shambles, holding on to little scraps of the world before the bombs. The section from the tower and also the main theme are the standouts on the soundtrack, and each have a hauntingly beautiful rhythm that elevates the other aspects of the game even higher than they would have already been. The ambient sounds and howling of mutated beasts raises the hairs on the back of your neck, as an attack could come from anywhere. Let's get moving along. Shit! Can you hear this? It's full back of me. And the faint whispers and shrieks of ghosts will send chills up your spine. Come closer to the tubes and listen. Just don't stay for too long.
Metro 2033 is an underrated masterpiece that fortunately seems to have been given a second chance at life thanks to the Redux package, but I hope I've given my own compelling arguments for why this is a game that needs to be experienced by everyone. Whether you enjoy narrative-driven first-person shooters or not, Metro 2033 will stand the test of time and will always remain one of my favorite games of all time. The sequel to Metro 2033, and the middle chapter of Arteom's story, Metro Last Light, is also absolutely phenomenal, and manages to improve on its predecessor in every way imaginable. Warning, spoilers ahead for the canon ending to Metro 2033. You've been warned. Metro Last Light picks up one year after the events of Metro 2033, which ended with Arteom and the Spartan Rangers discovering the long dormant D6 military bunker and launching a missile strike against the home of the Dark Ones. However, Arteom learns shortly before the missiles drop that the Dark Ones were simply attempting to communicate with humanity, not destroy them as was previously believed. However, he is too late to stop the mass genocide of the Dark Ones, and they are wiped from the face of the Earth. Arteom then officially joins the Spartan Order, but is still haunted by his choice to annihilate the Dark Ones in the form of nightmarish visions, revealing to him just how much blood is on his hands after destroying a new species and the potential for peace and coexistence between both humanity and the Dark Ones. One day, he is visited by Khan, who informs him that a Dark One survived the missile strike, but it is only a vulnerable and frightened infant. However, this small creature may hold the key to redeeming Arteom's soul and all of humanity with him. Last Light has a far more complex narrative than that of 2033. It involves romance, political intrigue, and sabotage, and also shows both the best and worst that humanity has to offer the world. The subtitle, Last Light, really is symbolic of Arteom's journey throughout the course of the game, as it is his last chance to redeem himself and also his fellow tunnel dwellers, as he brings humanity back into the light once again. The characters you encounter throughout the story are also far more interesting and three-dimensional than the ones seen in 2033. Yes, familiar faces like Khan, Ullman, and Colonel Miller return, but they are joined by more interesting fresh faces, such as Miller's daughter, Anna, who begins the story at odds with Arteon, but eventually finds a special place in his heart. Pavel, a commando for the Red Line, is your traveling companion throughout much of the first half of Last Light, and his character arc is the most morally challenging for both the player and Arteon. The villainous General Corbut of the Red Line also steals the show, in a story crowded with despicable figures. I won't detail much else about the characters of the story for the sake of spoilers, but suffice it to say that Last Light tells a far more cohesive narrative than 2033, and a more emotionally impactful one at that. Story isn't the only area that Last Light improves on, however. Last Light's gunplay sees massive improvements over 2033 in both overall feel and weapon variety. New categories like sniper rifles and heavy weapons make a booming entrance. The Valve bolt-action rifle offers massive stopping power and damage, with some of the most satisfying gunshot sound effects and reload animations I've ever seen or heard. New shotguns and pistols, such as the semi-automatic Low Life and Saiga, are also welcome additions, and each weapon offers various attachments that you can use to customize your loadout for many different combat scenarios, whether guns blazing or stealthy in nature. Stealth in Metro 2033 was serviceable, but Last Light managed to put systems in place that make a stealthier approach much easier for the player to navigate. You can turn off various light sources and even eliminate 
guards via non-lethal methods, which helps you net that good moral ending, I might add. Boss fights against various apex predators are also introduced in Last Light, requiring an extra layer of preparation on the player's part. Survival mechanics haven't been changed much, as you still have access to your flashlight and hand crank charger, your bullet lighter and journal, and also the gas mask and filters, but the gas mask has seen an extra feature added that makes immersion even more seamless. As your gas mask accrues condensation or blood spatters, you can press a button and Arteon will bring up his hand to wipe his mask clean, which is such a cool little detail that the developers really didn't even need to add, but they did it anyway. The gameplay succeeds in topping 2033, also in large part due to the new areas you explore and battle through. Levels in Last Light are more open-ended and exploratory than the ones featured in 2033, which was the natural route to take for the sequel in my opinion. 4A have even taken that design philosophy 10 steps further in Exodus, but that's for a different video. You now have more freedom to tackle combat and stealth encounters in various different ways, and the levels set on the surface, specifically the swamp level, feel vast and expansive without being too overwhelming. There are also also now markers and flags on the surface which are subtle guides to point the player towards either a point of narrative interest or small hideaways filled with invaluable supplies and ammo. These levels wouldn't be much though without stunning visual accompaniment. Last Light uses the vastly overhauled 4A engine, allowing for even more detail in the environment and characters. The environmental detail and lighting is some of, if not the best, I've ever seen in any first-person shooter. Seriously, just look at this. This video really doesn't even do it any justice, because YouTube compresses the quality of the footage by an insane degree, but this game is still being held up as a benchmark for PC graphics even six years after its initial release in 2013, and while the Redux version really only brought sweeping changes to Metro 2033, both that game and Last Light received extensive optimization improvements on the PC, and it shows. I'm combining these two categories for Last Light because much of what I already covered with Metro 2033 previously holds true in this game, and better in many areas. The Metro tunnels are still as dank and decrepit as ever, the surface is still harsh and uninviting, and the creatures still look absolutely disgusting, with many new ones like the boss types thrown in for good measure. The mutated bear, I think, is the highlight of the creatures in terms of of visual design. The music is serviceable, and it still follows the same beats that 2033 established, maintaining that strong focus on guitar over all other instruments. While I still prefer 2033's soundtrack over this, Last Light still manages to hold its own in the audio and visual department. Metro Last Light is what a great sequel should be. Better story, better gameplay, better graphics, better, better, better. It also takes cues from The Dark Knight, The Two Towers, and The Empire Strikes Back, as the middle chapter of a trilogy always manages to be the darkest in terms of narrative tone. It also sets the stage for the massive third installment by slowly peeling back the layers of the world beyond the tunnels and opening up the gameplay and levels to allow for great greater player freedom, a design philosophy I think all games can benefit from. Metro Last Light is a fantastic follow-up to 2033, and remains to this day one of my favorite games of all time. The Metro games are not ones to be rushed through and played only once. They demand that you take your time to truly soak in the detail of the world and the story. So those are my thoughts on both Metro 2033 and Metro Last Light and why I love them to death. But now I want to know what you think of the Metro franchise in the comments down below. Do you enjoy these games? 
Have you played them? Has this video compelled you to play them if you haven't already? Consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this, and be sure to hit that notification bell so you never miss a video. And remember that the outsider walks among us. Thanks for watching.